All right, Luke Acts for Beginners, lesson number 20, Paul's first missionary journey. And we're going to be covering Acts 13, 1 to 1535, a lot of uh, material. So last week we concluded Luke's description of Peter's ministry among the Jews and the calling that he received from God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Now after Pentecost, it seemed that the apostles understood the Great Commission to be that they, uh, they preached to all the Jews in the world. They understood you know, going to all the world, preach the gospel in their minds, preach the gospel to all the Jews in the world. It took a miraculous event, that's Cornelius speaking in tongues, to convince Peter to not only preach the, to the Gentiles, but to offer them the same salvation through faith expressed in repentance and baptism that he had offered the crowd that he was preaching to on the day of Pentecost. It took years you know, between those two events. Several years went by. This breakthrough encouraged others to bring the gospel to the Gentiles in the area of Antioch, where Barnabas and Paul had uh, an extensive preaching ministry among the mixed Jewish and Gentile uh, convert. So let's take a quick look at our, um, at our uh, outline and you'll note that we are beginning the second section of the book of Acts where Luke will deal primarily with Paul's ministry uh, and his uh, travels. So Luke has set the geographical scene. There's Antioch as well as the historical moment after Peter's contact with Cornelius uh, when Barnabas and Paul have gained considerable experience not only in working together, but working with the, uh, with the, uh, with the converts to Judaism as well, excuse me, uh, working with Jewish converts to uh, Christianity as well, uh, as uh, Gentiles who have been converted to Christianity. So now they're, they're gaining experience in working with these two uh, individual cultures as they're mixed <clears throat> for the first time in one uh, congregation at Antioch. So now we're going to take a look at the first uh, missionary journey that uh, Luke describes beginning in chapter 13. So it says, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon who was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So what we read here is really the third step in Paul's call to ministry. His call to ministry sets a pattern for those who feel they are called to full-time ministry, but are not sure if theirs is a legitimate calling from God. I've known a lot of people say, you know, I don't know if I should go into ministry or not. You know, I, I don't know if I have a calling or not. Uh, and whenever that happens, I encourage them to read the book of Acts and to study you know, Paul's ministry and how he was called. So there are three stages in a call to ministry that are demonstrated in, these, uh, in this passage, not just in the passage here, but in the, in the New Testament. The first of which is the calling itself. This describes the way God has called or directed or led a person into full-time uh, ministry. Paul, the apostle, was called in a miraculous way. He was blinded, he heard the voice of the Lord, he was healed of his blindness and we read in Acts chapter 9 verses 3 to 9 and then in verse 17 uh, about his experience. But the manner of his calling is the exception, not the rule. Not everybody is called in a miraculous way. For most people the calling begins as a desire or an opportunity to serve in some way that grows stronger and stronger with time or it could take the form of positive feedback from church members or church leaders who see talent in a person and they encourage them to develop and use that particular skill in the service to the Lord. If somebody asks you to get up and uh, maybe you know, do a devotional or a, perhaps a lesson, and you do that, you do several, you know, no one ever says anything, <laughs> ever. <laughs> you do your best, no feedback, zero. You know? Well, maybe that's not your skill set. You know? 
but if, uh, if, if you happen to get up and do something and you start getting a lot of feedback and you do it again and you get a lot more feedback and the, the elders and the preacher said, now you, you know, you've got skill and you know, you're getting that positive reinforcement that tells you, well, maybe I do have a gift. Maybe I do have an ability that can be uh, used for the Lord. Um, many ministers go into full-time ministry because they see a great need that the church or the lost have and they feel compelled to step up and fill the gap. Even if they don't feel you know, you know, qualified 100%, the, the need is so great, they, they, they've just got to go. How many people have gone on mission trips? You know, young college students who are in like engineering or something and then they go on a mission trip to some country, Mozambique or South America, and it changes their lives completely. They see the need for the gospel and they just come back and they just switch out their major and they go into the Bible department and you know, decide to become missionaries because God has put a burden on their heart for, the, for those particular uh, people. We have one young guy who was a member of the church in Montreal. He comes from Brazil, emigrated with his family to Montreal, went to church in Montreal and so on and so forth, and then went to Harding. And then he went on a, he went on a mission trip to Mozambique. And now he's you know, almost finished and he's, he's trying to raise money to go preach the gospel in Mozambique. Imagine a Brazilian who goes to Montreal and then goes to Harding and then, and then ends up in Mozambique. It's, it's just amazing how God uses people. Amazing how the call comes. So whatever the way a person is called, one feature is the same for all. And that is the feeling that God is calling. Uh, that feeling that God is calling you never goes away. Month in and month out. You try this, you try that, but that thing's always there, always pulling at you. Some people battle with it for years and even when they choose to do something else, they still continue to feel that calling from time to time. So the first step you know, to call to ministry is the the calling itself. The second step is consecration. The consecration or the setting apart is the time that the called person spends in preparation for their ministry. Now in Paul's case, there was a period of approximately 10 to 12 years between the time he was called on the road to Damascus and the time in Acts 13 where you know, the church sends him out on his formal uh, mission trip, his first formal uh, mission trip. During that time, during that 10 to 12 year period, he spent three years in the desert of Arabia being taught by the Spirit of Christ. And he explains that himself in Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 to 17. He traveled to Jerusalem and then returned to teach in his hometown of, Tar uh, of uh, Tarsus, Acts chapter 9, for an additional four years. He was then recruited by Barnabas to come and teach at the Antioch church, where that mixed church, you know, Jews and Gentiles who had become Christian. He was recruited by Barnabas to go there and teach for an entire year. And then finally, he and Barnabas were uh, escorting food and relief supplies to Jerusalem after a two-year famine had gripped the country. And that we read about in Acts chapter 12. So Paul's consecration period sees him being taught by the Lord, teaching at the church in Antioch, traveling and meeting with various apostles and church leaders, in addition to managing a benevolence program to help the church in Jerusalem. All of this, a decade or more of training and preparation for the ministry he was called to do on the very day of his conversion. On the day of his conversion, you know, Jesus tells him, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles, but he spends 10 years in training before he's actually sent to go preach. Uh, to the Gentiles. So what's the, you know, what's the comparable thing you know, nowadays? Well today we have preacher training schools operated by various congregations in our brotherhood. There are also colleges and universities where a person with a calling can receive training to prepare um, him or her because there are many, times of full, many types of full-time ministry open to women today. Um, these are the places where uh, individuals who want to go into full-time ministry go for training. Now the confusion that some people have is thinking that you begin your ministry the moment you feel your calling. That's a mistake. Okay. If, you feel you, you know, if you feel that you know, your calling in life is to be a doctor, do you put on a white coat and buy a stethoscope and just you know, nominate yourself to be, you know, who would go to that doctor, right? 
Why would we think it's any different if you feel your calling is to be a minister? Just because you feel the calling doesn't make you qualified. So the consecration time is important because it usually serves to confirm if ministry is really your calling or not. You know, I tell young people, especially young guys, you know, if you like to speak in public, if that's the part of ministry that you like, you know, you're not going to enjoy ministry because that, that part is very small. An hour or two a week maybe. If you don't, if you don't like to study, if you don't like to read, <laughs> If you, don't, if you don't like books, if you don't like to dissect ideas, this isn't for you. Pulpit ministry is not for you anyways. If you don't enjoy people, if you don't have a willingness to help people, and if you're a loner, maybe this is not, this is not for you. If you like public speaking, well, you know, be a weatherman. You know, uh, become a politician. Do, you know. There are other things that you can do to be to be helpful. So the calling, the consecration, and the commendation. The commendation to ministry is what is taking place, what we just read there, Acts 13, one to three. The Holy Spirit through the church, and when I say through the church, I mean through its leaders and teachers. So the Holy Spirit through the church commend or send or authorized Paul and Barnabas to take the gospel to the world. We have to remember that God always works through His church, on behalf of His church. For example, there are no self-appointed elders. You ever notice that? No man ever stands up and says, you know what, I think I'm, I think I'm elder material. And I think today I'm just going to start calling myself an elder and I'm going to ask the brethren to start calling me an elder. There are no self-appointed, I mean, I, I know that's ridiculous, but there's no, there are no self-appointed elders. Those who serve in that way are appointed. They're trained by evangelists. That's the work of the evangelist, to raise up elders, to train elders, to encourage them, teach them, motivate them. Acts chapter 14, verse 33, or 23, Titus chapter 1, 5. There are no self-appointed evangelists. There, even if you know the Bible, you can't appoint yourself, I'm going to be an evangelist. Really? Where, where do you see that in the, in the Bible, that an evangelist, you know, a preacher, appoints himself as the preacher to the church? That doesn't happen. These are appointed by elders. First Timothy chapter four, verse 14. I mean, if we're serious about New Testament Christianity, if we're serious about you know, restoring New Testament church, well, that's how a New Testament church operates. Nobody is self-appointed. There are no self-appointed deacons. These men are selected by the church and they're confirmed by the elders. Acts 6 verses 3 to 6 and then you know, in Timothy Paul gives the qualifications of these men. There are no self-appointed missionaries. <clears throat> Excuse me. No self-appointed missionaries. These are trained by the church and they are confirmed and sent by the church leadership always. We see this taking place with Paul and Barnabas as the first missionaries confirmed and sent by the church and this method continues to this day in the Lord's church. It isn't a certificate of studies or a college degree that authorizes a person to be an evangelist or a teacher or a missionary. It is the commendation by the church that sends or confirms both your calling and your consecration to the Lord's service in and for His church. The church commends people to go into the mission field. I mean, it doesn't mean that uh, you're an accountant and you get, a, you get a, a transfer to St. Louis or somewhere and there's no church in that area and you take it upon yourself to start meeting in the home and you know, sure, to start a church. That happens all the time. But you can't appoint yourself at that moment as being the elder of that church. It doesn't work that way. So we look at the first missionary journey, Acts 13, uh, verse four, somewhere around 44 to 46 AD. We don't have the time to read, of course, the entire passage describing the first missionary journey, so let's look at a, a kind of an overview effort, of this effort, rather, uh, geographically. Luke writes that Paul and Barnabas and his uh, cousin, John Mark, 
leave from the port city of uh, Seleucia near Antioch and they sailed to the island of Cyprus where Barnabas was originally from. We read about his background in uh, Acts chapter four. Uh, then they go to Salamis, uh, Acts 13 verse five, that's their first stop. The friendly confines of the local synagogue where Barnabas was probably known and welcomed to speak. Isn't that kind of, I always say, it, isn't it kind of human nature? Where do we go first? Well, let's, let's go to where I know somebody. Let's go to Cyprus. Let's go to the church or the synagogue where I come from, says Barnabas. At this point, he's the leader of the, of the, mission, of the mission team, if you wish. So at this point they're reaching out to the Jews since this was the opportunity that was open to. Where do we go first? Well, let's go here first. You know, I, I, I know the elder of this synagogue and we'll be able to speak there. All right, let's go. Then they go to Paphos, Acts 13, six to 12. Let's read about that. It says, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him, and said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold the hand of the Lord's upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So note that their work on the island was so successful that the governor sent for them to hear the message. Now the fact that Barnabas is mentioned first suggests that he is the leader and the chief speaker at this point. Elimus, by the way, meant the expert if you translate that into English, he was known as the expert. So this magician was called Bar-Jesus the expert. And this magician who had the favor of the governor interfered with their mission. So Paul denounces him and, um, and uh, Bar-Jesus is rendered blind for a period of time. And this is the first miracle credited to Paul. The first miracle credited to Paul that we, that we read of. The governor is converted. And Luke mentions that it was the teaching of the Lord that amazed him, not the blinding of the magician. The miracle confirmed the teaching, but it was the teaching that actually converted him. We keep reading in Acts 13, 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Note that, um, note that Luke now names Paul first. Little subtle changes. He was naming Bar uh, Barnabas first, then there's the miracle and what happened on Cyprus, but now Luke begins to mention Paul before he mentions uh, Barnabas, showing the transition of leadership. John Mark leaves them to return to Jerusalem probably because he lacked the courage to travel on in an unknown land. I want you to note also, again, the small things between the lines. Note that it was Barnabas and Paul in that order that had been called by the Spirit to undertake this mission. John Mark was added by Barnabas, his cousin, not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit didn't say, I want Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. He just said Barnabas and Saul. They just, Barnabas decided to take his cousin, and we see what took place. So God knew that John Mark wasn't ready, it took Barnabas and John Mark and Paul a little bit longer to discover this as well. So we move on to um, uh, Pisidian Antioch. Give you a little closer view of that. There we go, that's where we're talking about. So Paul and Barnabas do no work in Perga, but they make their way north to the city of Antioch located on the border of Pisidia. 
thus named to differentiate it from the city of Antioch, which is located in Syria, from which they come. So there's two Antiochs, that's the confusion. One's in Syria near the coast, and, and one is up uh, in, uh, in uh, Pisidia. It's like Paris, Texas and Paris, France. You, know, you have a lot of similar sounding, uh, similar, uh, similar cities with similar names. So this was the case uh, here as well. So they're in this particular Antioch. Here Luke gives a detailed account of Paul's preaching and the reaction of the people to him and Barnabas' teaching. So let's read a snip of that, verse 14. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So Luke describes the method that Paul used in preaching the gospel among the Jews and the converts to the Jewish faith. The service was led by elders or officials who would invite visiting rabbis to speak or to teach. So Paul, I mean, let's face it, for that day and time, Paul was the famous student of Gamaliel and Barnabas, a Levite and resident of Jerusalem. Both of these men were known among the Jews and so Paul was asked to speak. He was you know, relatively famous. Luke records the lesson that was probably a basic lesson that Paul preached when addressing a Jewish audience. And so his lesson has four parts and could be entitled, you know, if, if, if his sermon had a title, it would be Israel's Savior is Jesus Christ. That would be the title of his sermon and it had four parts. The first part was Israel's history leads to Jesus. And I'll read the section. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So you know, uh, uh, Paul uh, uh, quotes this particular verse in order to explain how, who Jesus was historically, who he was to the Jews historically. The second section of his sermon, Israel rejects its savior the Savior spoken of by the prophets, prophets and sent by God. So he says, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Like I say, I'm only reading little parts of what he says, but he mentions this here uh, to convict the Jews for having rejected the Messiah. Part three of his lesson, God raised him from the dead. And so God fulfills His promises to Israel by, raise, by raising the Messiah from the dead. Uh, in Acts 13, 32, 33, He says, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that He raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The fourth part of His lesson is forgiveness and salvation are only in Jesus Christ. He says, therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through Him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through Him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. So there, you know, there's, uh, there's just a, a, a summary of his sermon. This was his basic stump, so, you know, like, like politicians have a stump speech that they kind of give over and over again. This was, this was Peter's stump sermon. This was his basic sermon when he went into a synagogue to preach. The history of the Jews leading up to Jesus, what they did to Jesus, what God did to Jesus by raising him from the dead, and that now you're responsible. You know, God appeals to you through Jesus uh, to have faith. So in the following verses, a familiar pattern emerges where Paul's words draw crowds which antagonize the Jewish leaders who begin attacking Paul's teaching, because he's rocking the boat here. Many Jews and Gentile converts decide to follow Paul and his teachings to the point where Paul declares openly that because of Jewish rejection and persecution, he's going to focus his ministry on the Gentiles. Now remember, he's He's originally sent to the Gentiles. That, that was the ministry that God gave to him. Uh, but with time, but he begins with the Jews. That's the point I'm trying to make. 
He starts with the Jews, but he's always pushed to go and preach to the Gentiles. So this produces joy and enthusiasm among the Gentiles because salvation was now offered to them by God and they could now be equal partners with Jewish Christians with whom they would share a place in God's kingdom, which is the church. So we move along. Iconium, Lyconia, Lystra, Derbe in Acts chapter 14. Luke mentions several towns where they continued preaching and teaching. He focuses actually on two places. One is Iconium, Acts 14. The same pattern appears here as their preaching divides the audience. Some believe, others don't believe. And the Jews step up their opposition by enlisting Gentiles to form a mob to stone Paul and Barnabas, but they escape to another one of the cities mentioned in verse six. Another city, this time Lystra, Acts 14, eight to 20. Luke describes a second miracle performed by Paul, the healing of a man who was lame from birth, which causes a stir in the crowds who think that Paul and Barnabas are the incarnation of, pagan, of the pagan god Zeus, you know, the Greek god of the sky and thunder, and Hermes, son of the Greek god Zeus. So the, the inhabitants you know, mistake them for some of their Greek mythological uh, gods. So let's pick up a small portion of the passage here. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, in other words, they heard that the people were, were going to offer sacrifice to them because they thought they were their, you know, their mythical gods. But when the apostles Paul and Barnabas heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying, uh, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own way. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with good and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So Paul takes advantage of the situation and he begins preaching to these Gentiles using the very situation at hand as a kind of a starting point. Let's keep reading verse 19. It says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. So Paul has no chance to continue his teaching, no chance to keep going. Okay, as the Jews from other cities begin following them from town to town. Bad enough, he goes into a city and he preaches and some of them reject him. Now these people are forming a you know, vigilante posse, if you wish, and they're kind of following him from city to city, trying to disrupt his, uh, his, uh, his ministry. Uh, he's been harassed, he's been chased, but this time the Jews managed to capture and stone him on the spot and then drag his body outside the city, leaving him there for dead. Luke simply states that Paul, surrounded by disciples, probably gathering to bury him, <laughs> they thought he was dead, so we might as well bury the body. He wakes up. Now there's no mention of a miracle here, so he was probably unconscious. And what does he do? He goes back into the city. Another place that they go to is uh, Derbe. Luke briefly mentions that Paul and Barnabas go to this city to preach and they have many converts and no opposition in Derby. Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. At this point, they begin to backtrack and revisit the people and the young churches that they had planted during this first two-year mission trip. So what I've just explained to you, two years in just a few, in just a few words. So let's read Acts 14, 23. It says, when they had appointed elders, see, you see there? When they had appointed elders, no, no elders appointed themselves. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So many Jewish converts had the moral and spiritual maturity to serve as elders in these young churches. You know, if you were an elder in one of the synagogues, uh, you had the moral and, 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 and intellectual maturity to be an elder in the church. What you needed was an understanding of the gospel, of course. 
But a, a man who was qualified as an elder in a synagogue had all those, quali you know, had all those quali same type of qualifications that are required by an elder in a, in a Christian church. That's why they could do this uh, so quickly. Christianity was the fulfillment of the Jewish faith and the knowledge of the gospel was the final mystery that rounded out and completed all that they had learned and believed as Jews. In that first generation church, many Jewish converts continued to practice their Jewish faith and they held to the Jewish liturgical calendar. You, know, you were a Christian, but you still celebrated Passover and you still you know, you went for a Pentecost. You were culturally still a Jew, even if you had become a Christian. With time, however, and the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD, the distinction and the practice of these two faiths became quite separate, with Christianity being recognized as a standalone faith and not simply a sect or a type connected to the Jewish religion. So it took several generations, okay, especially for the Jewish Christians, to realize that no, this is a different religion uh, altogether. Uh, Pamphylia, Perga, Ital um, Italia, and Antioch are the cities mentioned next. Luke continues naming the various stops along their route home to Antioch in Syria. Luke notes that Paul and Barnabas gather the church that had originally sent them out in order to give them a report of their work and especially about the breakthrough they had in preaching and converting Gentiles. This sets up the next scene where Luke describes an important meeting and decision concerning the Gentiles and their entry into the church. So Luke summarizes the issue and the approach to its resolution in these first two verses. So let's look at that. Now some men came down from Judea. Now realize what's happening. Paul and Barnabas have come back. They're back with their home church. Okay. Then it says, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. There's the issue right there. Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. You know, when you're talking about Jerusalem, you're always going up to Jerusalem or coming down from Jerusalem. Even if you were north or south, didn't matter. You always go up to Jerusalem in, in Jewish thought. Okay. So Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, uh, probably Pharisees who were converted to Christianity, came to Antioch teaching that Gentiles had to first adhere to Jewish laws of conversion before they could become Christians. This meant that they had to first be circumcised before they could be baptized. Well, you think it's hard to get somebody to accept, <laughs> to accept baptism? Imagine if you say, well, yeah, but before you're baptized, you also have to be circumcised. Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah. That would be an uphill battle because most Jewish you know, men had been circumcised as babies. All right. So if you were a Pharisee of that era converted to Christ, this idea was quite logical. Nothing crazy about this idea. I mean, Judaism came first. Jesus was a Jew. Christianity was simply an extension of the Jewish faith. So adhering to Jewish law and custom before identifying as a Christian, this made all the sense in the world to them. It was like an easy sell. It was easy to preach. It was easy to, you know, to, to, to argue. For them, baptism was a kind of an add-on, if you wish. Fine, you want to be baptized? Good enough, fair, go ahead. The problem with this mindset and the teaching that came from it was that it did not understand Christianity's relationship to Judaism. Judaism and its religion was a vehicle that was designed to deliver Jesus, the Son of God, Savior of mankind, to the world. Judaism, if you wish, was a historical and cultural and religious stage or platform upon which God would place Jesus, the Savior. Let me read something out of Matthew here. It says, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all Gentiles who are called by my name. So the gospel was not just for the Jews, the gospel was for everybody. 
And so Jewish rituals and laws and practice were meant to be a preview and a practice of what was to come. Jesus dying as a perfect sacrifice to save mankind from condemnation due to sin. That's what all the animal sacrifices were supposed to be pointing to, were supposed to be preparing them to. That you know, a death was required to absolve one of sin. And for centuries they practiced that idea using animals. Why? Because one day it would be a man who would die. The Son of God actually, who would die. So these Jewish Christians thought that their religion was the substance of God's will, when in fact it was only a shadow of what God had planned to do through Christ. And that is, make eternal life possible through faith in Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. This teaching was dangerous also because it substituted a salvation based on law, the principle of law you be circumcised, you obey food and other kind of laws in order to be worthy to be baptized and then become a Christian. Wow, talk about <laughs> narrowing the doorway to, to the kingdom of God. So they were replacing a gospel based on grace and faith that said, I am saved because I believe in Jesus and I express my faith in Him through repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38. This was being replaced with, I am saved because I obey the law, circumcision and rules and regulations of Judaism. In other words, I am saved because I do things instead of I am saved because I believe something. Big difference, big difference. So the solution is in Acts chapter two, verse 35. Don't have time to read that, but we'll just read the opening sentence for now. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So we don't have time to read this entire passage all the way down to 35, but I did want to examine the approach that they took to resolve this matter. Since Antioch was a church consisting of both Jews and Gentiles, and since much of Paul's ministry involved outreach to non-Jews, there was a lot at stake for him. I mean, they'd been out in the road for two years. All of this was going down the drain now. Note that all parties, the missionaries, the Jewish Christian teachers, the elders of the church, and the apostles, all together came to discuss this issue. This was not decided by an executive group or Peter as some kind of chief apostle. Luke records that there was extensive discussion and records, part of, and records rather, part of Peter's argument. Let's read Acts chapter 15. Here's Peter arguing. He says, now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way that they also are. He also argued that bringing the gospel to the Gentiles was part of God's plan recorded in the scripture. Read that passage there. He said, Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. So these are just little bits of the argument you know, and the discussion going back and forth. And Peter makes the argument that, no, no, the gospel was meant for the Gentiles as well. And certainly we're not going to lay the law on them because we found out that we couldn't obey the law. That's why, that's why Jesus came, because we couldn't be perfect through obedience. We have to be made perfect through faith. And so Paul, uh, Peter, of course, has a, a firm grasp of what the gospel is. And you kind of pick up the argument as you read, uh, as you read through. Peter also argued that bringing the gospel to the Gentiles was part of God's plan recorded in the scriptures, as I've just read here. In the end, everyone agrees to continue preaching to the Gentiles with a caution to avoid sexual immorality. And the reason for that is that sexual immorality was a large part of the Gentile lifestyle because many of them participated in religious rituals that involved sexual immorality. So the extra warning to them, they need to be careful, they need to work on that. 
Also respect of certain Jewish sensitivities towards eating meat that was previously offered in pagan sacrifices and then sold in the public marketplace and of course the eating of blood which was forbidden for Jews. In other words, he's saying, look, you're saved, you're good. And I say to you, in order to maintain smooth relationships in a mixed congregation, he says to Gentile, make a special effort to maintain sexual purity and make an effort to be sensitive to the, the food laws that many of your Jewish brethren still find themselves uh, under. So these were given to guarantee peace in the assembly where both Jews and Gentiles worshiped and often ate fellowship meals together. Had to be careful. Paul talks about this meat offered to sacrifice again in 1 Corinthians. That was, that's, that's nothing for us today. You, know, you buy a hamburger at Walmart, you're not afraid that that hamburger, you know, that cow was offered to a pagan god or something, right? But in the first century, there was always that possibility. So you have the problem stated and debated and resolved according to God's word, because you notice that even the apostles and the leaders in the Jewish church were quoting scripture to each other to make their point, as we still do today. Luke finishes this section by recording the joyful reaction of the Gentile Christians at the news that they were not to be subjected to the Jewish law and were accepted by no less than the apostles themselves as equal and full members of God's church along with their Jewish brethren who had been converted. The final scene sees Paul and Barnabas remaining in Antioch, busy teaching and preaching to the brethren there. So we're going to stop right here, a good stopping point. Here's the assignment for next week. Read uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 36, all the way through to Acts chapter 18, verse 22, as we make our way uh, through the book of Acts. All right, that's the lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.